Um, so, the future. I'm often asked to talk about the future, um, and to be honest, it terrifies me. Um, I've been thinking long and hard about a really good response for this quite provocative call, um, and I can honestly say that I don't have a complete answer or anything that's close to a satisfying answer for you, um, just a set of trajectories and experiments and things that we've been exploring and experimenting with. Um, I think it's difficult because, as an artist and designer, I find myself really painfully torn between these very utopian dreams and dystopian nightmares. And I guess that's hardly surprising when we're bombarded with bad news all the time about climate change, scarcities, mass extinction, political and social unrest, and I can barely look at the news at the moment. Um, and I guess I've always found solace and inspiration from reading science fiction novels, but many of these narratives don't kind of help with my dilemma either, with end-of-world scenarios, near-future catastrophes, rising sea levels, etc., etc. Terrible viruses are going to wipe us all out. Um, but I really think these negative, dystopic visions um, that we see in popular culture often limit people's abilities to such an extent that they can no longer dream big or think and act differently in the world. I'm also a mother, and I'm quite saddened by many children today actually suffer depression over worries about the plight of our planet and they're gripped by fear over a potential World War III. And I don't think this is the next generation that we want to be nurturing. So this is why I've made it my task to create the playgrounds for future-making, with hope, creativity, imagination and people really at the centre, whilst recognising that we do face some serious challenges ahead. So one of the topics that I wanted to share with you today is one about scarcity and the city, and looking at how we've been developing participatory initiatives um, back in London in our studio that tackle this and look for the abundance, looking at issues uh, and challenges from food, energy, water, and even sleep. So as a designer, um, I can speak on behalf of design, and I believe designers to be some of the most important spokespersons and agents for change in creating more resilient and sustainable futures. After all, they're the people who help sh shape the way in which we experience the world around us. Which is why I founded Loop.ph in London over 12 years ago now, um, and we described the studio as a, as a spatial laboratory. And it was always our ambition to establish a totally different design practice, one where people from really different disciplines can come together and experiment in a really playful environment and work on meaningful projects that radically rethink the city. So I run um, multidisciplinary projects, and I get to manage diverse teams of people that come from architecture, engineering, material science, mathematics, and biology. We have some really incredible people that work with us in the studio that I think are watching this live stream now, so hello to all you amazing people. Um, and really, our agenda is the, in the studio is to create environments and experiences that communicate and engage people with science and technology in a really positive and enlightening way. We also choose to work outside of quite the traditional setting of a gallery, a museum, a laboratory in order to do, to do what we call place-based experiments um, in public space. So my message today is also one about speculation and activation. Um, I'm interested in activating public space, activating imagination so that people act and create in the here and the now. And um, I get to operate in this really amazing transformational place where design fiction meets design activism. I think there's so much speculation in design right now when there needs to be much more real-life, messy experiments going on. And I guess we're starting to see that now with the emerging fields of DIY cities and the hacker-maker communities which are mushrooming up all over cities across the world. And I think it's really important that these activities happen um, in order for cities to be built from the bottom up, interfacing, interfacing the kind of very historic top-down development of cities. So I'm from London, live in one of the, the biggest cities in Europe, and my work's really rooted in the city and defining a role for designers to intervene on an urban scale. And the arts and culture play such an important part in creating these bottom-up cities with participatory projects, citizen science and temporary interventions. And I guess I'm really interested in the role that designers and citizens can play in activating and transforming public space and carving out spaces in the city for dreaming and cultivating imagination for how things could be. 
And one of our tools is storytelling and creating quite spectacular experiences and temporary happenings. Uh, an example being, last year we received a really amazing, quite a daunting brief, um, and we were asked to recreate the cosmos in a really downtrodden part of London, underneath a busy motorway. Um, we had very little time and very little budget, and it was a very awkward public space with a huge amount of um, antisocial and behavioural problems in that area. We literally had to clear the street of knee needles and other stuff I won't mention. We've also recently started working within organizations and community groups and big brands to use some of these design processes that we've been developing to creatively explore alternative futures in quite carefully facilitated spaces. Um, and a lot of the work that we do can be very serious and heavy, but I think as a designer and artist, I think it's important to also look at things which are quite light and fun and whimsical and playful. Um, so this is an example of where we've been asking questions like what happens when design, when we can design and print living tissue at home. On to a slightly more serious note, but still on this vein of looking at life and biology and questioning. Um, one of the core strategies in the studio is to really work to um, a design criteria that's based on ecological paradigms. Um, so I think our traditional understanding of design is often quite planned and predetermined and, and fixed, whereas life is evolutionary, adaptive and emergent. And some of the core principles um, that we learn from ecology uh, are here that we embed into our studio practice. So it's ideas around adaptiveness, abundance, diversity, succession, emergence, the idea of seeding design and letting it grow, uh, transformation and resilience. These are all sort of core concepts, and I'll show how they've manifest in, in a few of our projects. Um, so kind of going back quite a few years, I think it was over 10 years ago, that was one of the first designers to be using biomimetic principles in design and developed the, the first uh, adaptive, responsive material for the, for the built environment. Uh, and it was really my dream and vision back then to create textiles for the home that behaved and functioned in the way that plants do. So I was studying uh, photosynthesis and ideas around heliotropism, the way that plants move to the sun, and looking at how we could create future materials that would function in the same way. Um, this was then looking at biomimicry, but I guess today one of the the key concepts right now is, is eco-mimicry, is looking to ecology and systems and looking at how we can mimic and be inspired by them. So this is essentially the study of ecologies and taking a much more systems approach to design, looking at relationships, patterns and interconnectedness. So I work in the studio, explores and speculates on new modes of fabricating architectural space now. And one of the questions that we ask is how can we build architecture and spaces as nature does? Um, I really like this um, example where we look at the periodic table of elements that's been uh, reconfigured by Neil Spohr, and he's basically put the lightest elements on top in this pyramid. Um, and then if we start to look at how biology and nature builds around us, it only ever uses the top two substats, the lightest ones, whereas our man-made materials are kind of all jumbled up and use everything. And I think as designers, it's super important to understand uh, scientific developments and understand the world on this scale as well in order to design better systems and materials. 
So we're looking at carbon nanoscience. We're looking at how we can build lightweight architecture through understanding、um, carbon bonds. So structures that you would only see on a molecular level, we're blowing them up to the human and architectural scale, and we're looking at this as a strategy to build lightweight, adaptable architectural structures and space frames. So we call this body of work Archilace, and it's an experimental architectural construction technique that we've been developing for over 10 years now, and it's essentially structural lace making、um, on a huge architectural scale that uses advanced geometry. Um, and de designed in a 3D parametric design environment. This piece that you see here、um, is called the Soldome,、uh, and works with a number of sensors integrated into the base. So it's an animate structure that's responding to the environment and reflecting the changing CO2 levels of this space. So I mean, the very basic principle of this work:、um, the circle is a kind of flexible building block where hundreds of them get woven together into this advanced geometric cellular form, and we always. Travel with a bag of these sort of spaghetti rods, and we'll work with local volunteers and local people to fabricate these structures all over the world.、Uh, and essentially, this is a provocation of how our architecture could be. And we're exploring this idea of an animate, responsive architecture—architecture architecture that breathes and adapts to its environment. So we're developing structures also that grow in response to the conditions of its site,、um, in order to what we're calling、um, a scaffold for life that can support an urban ecology. So these structures essentially can be grown in a 3D software using local environmental、um, sensor data, and,、um, such as UV,、uh, wind,、um, solar, different types of environmental、uh, data, and, and then actually grow these and then build them on. So、um, what I wanted to talk about is a, is a collaboration that happened quite a few years ago,、um, and this was on a really amazing project called Noble Textiles, and it, was, and it was an experiment to see what happened when you brought together a textile designer with a with a with a Nobel Prize-winning scientist, and it was kind of an interesting experiment, and it was quite difficult at times.、Um, but basically, I was paired with somebody called John Walker, who discovered the rotary mechanism of ATP synthase, which you can see over here. And basically, he got his Nobel Prize in '97 for discovering basically the first biological machine,、uh, which is this rotary mechanism,、um, and it's a, such a fundamental process for life, and it's responsible for photosynthesis, respiration.、Um, it's, it's in every living cell, plant, human. It's incredible, and learning about this completely changed the way that I saw the world. This was a two-year, two-year collaboration, and we later went on to collaborate with him、uh, and his team,、uh, developing techniques. And essentially, we, we began looking at this notion of energy and metabolism.、Um, and really, what I wanted to do at this point was to be able to share this experience of discovery much more widely and look at how we could close the huge gaps of understanding that exist between specialist disciplines and the general public. So we developed this initiative called Solar Jam, which essentially、um, is a workshop where、um, people can come and make their own photovoltaic solar cells with really simple kitchen materials. So this is kind of kind of a amateur science in action,、um, and we're looking at the relationship between food and the lifespan of these technologies.、Um, and what we do is we、um, we extract the dye from berries and things like citrus leaves. 
um, and take the dye. Uh, and with that dye, we, we, we create textiles, um, we dye photovoltaic cells, and we also eat the stuff. So it's really looking at this kind of messy um, relationship between kitchens and labs. So these are edible, edible solar cells. Well, not, not the glass part, of course. Um, and this was a lovely girl who made a beautiful tie-dye so piece of textile with it also. Um, so I think since then, we've just started to look at the city as this really complex and emergent living system. Um, and a lot of the systems in, in play are really unsustainable. Um, and to, be, to, look at the, to look at the city uh, through the eyes of uh, a molecular biologist and looking at, starting to understand metabolisms, you start to see ways in which designers can intervene and, 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 have, an, and have an action. So, in terms of the city, we're seeing the greatest movement and migration of people to cities in history, which creates huge challenges, but also great opportunities. So I think it's time to radically rethink how our cities are built and tended. Uh, and I think we need experiments, um, live experiments, because uh, the old systems aren't working. Um, so I'm going to very, very quickly show you four examples that deal with scarcity in the city. The first one is called Metabolicity. Um, and this essentially is a, a project where we look to bring um, NASA food-growing technology um, into different parts of London to look at different ways that we could be growing food in the city in the context of like, living technologies with quite limited resources. And this really came from researching how NASA are developing aeroponics, um, which is a way of growing plants in a, in a, in a nutrient-rich, very highly controlled environment. And I kind of really figured, you know, if this is good enough for NASA and out of space, then it's going to be good enough for our housing estates, community centers, and schools that have no access to soil. If they do, it's highly polluted. So it's really bringing this technology into the city and allowing people to experiment with it. So we grew food in community centers, housing estates, schools, restaurants, all these different places. And I really think this is a vision for how designers can be working in an urban context, as scary as it is to be out there doing these live projects. Um, second example is dealing with, with energy, which is a core um, idea of a core uh, strategy of the studio. And we were actually commissioned by EDF in 2012 to create a series of installations that looked at energy. They initially wanted us to uh, visualize how much energy people are using, but we found this was far too, far too guilt-driven. And we started to look at um, what's actually being developed in the labs right now in terms of energy, what's, happening, what's going to be happening tomorrow. So we started looking at different research stories and strands. Um, we were looking at how you could be bioengineering trees so that they bi bioluminesce and replace streetlights. We looked at people who were developing um, uh, materials which mimic the tr um, trees' abilities to capture carbon and how we could coat this onto the trees. Um, we looked at all these different strands. We looked at how we could be using um, algae as a biofuel. And basically, we, we talked about a, a park of the future um, where, that would be getting all of our energy from these biological, biological systems. And as part of this project, um, we also designed and developed this pavilion, which is basically a, a home for a, a workshop series for six months, where over like 500 children um, in Lille came and learnt the science behind these ideas and had some hands-on experience. Um, they built solar cells, they looked at algae as a facade, um, and all sorts of other things. So there's a huge trend right now for architects to green their buildings and, and develop these living facades, and I think they're going to be a really important um, technology, living technology for the future. Um, but what we were really interested in at this time was making them this technology accessible and, and, and comfortable. So these tubes were knitted into these very familiar neck curtains, and they'd have algae constantly being pumped through it and photosynthesizing. And I think what I really learned from this is that to communicate these quite new and alien ideas, um, it helps to have it grounded in the, in the familiar of the, of the everyday. So basically something happened in my life recently. I got just absolutely exhausted and worn out with work. And I sort of experienced this epiphany, like, wow, there's like such things as leisure and relaxation, not just work all the time. Um, so we started to like look at this sort of new strand of work, because everything becomes a project. Um, and I sort of called it restorative placemaking. It's a bit of a silly name, um, but, but basically it's sort of looking at how you can transform parts of the city and just look at stillness and contemplation and restoration. 
So basically, what we've been working on is this idea of a, of a new type of public bathhouse, and this is looking again at the scarcity of, of water, looking at some of the ideas that Buckminster Fuller was developing in the 1950s,、um, where water would be so scarce in the future that we would all have to shower under these fog guns. And I really liked this idea,、uh, and I thought, well, let's create this public bathhouse where we all enter this huge cloud of fragrant fog, and we and we bathe together, you know,、uh, beyond just meeting up in the pub. We can be in these clouds. Um, and it became a, just an incredible experience in itself. Okay, the very last scarcity is sleep. So I don't get very much sleep because I'm working all the time. So I thought it'd be really good to do a project that deals with sleep.、Um, and there's a huge deficit in our modern day lives. People are sleeping less and less and less.、Um, and basically, I was—I had a phone call asking if I wanted to do a project. What would it be about? And I'm like, well, you know, I need sleep. Come on. So this is a project that we just delivered、uh, last month in Singapore, the Festival of Tech. Uh, and people were suspended in these hammocks, and we developed an audiovisual environment that would reset their circadian rhythm.、Uh, so we worked with a composer and developed a sound,、uh, a sound piece that took people into these different relaxation states,、um, as well as looking at a, a very specific light program.、Um, and we've started working with neuroscientists now so that we can monitor and really look at the、um, look at the effects of the brain being in these environments. So to conclude,、um, the future is. I guess what I've really realised recently: the future is not nearly as important as being present in the present and really actively participating in shaping the future that you want to be part of. So to quote a great couple of guys, Gandhi and William Gibson, the future depends on what you want to do today. Because the future is already here, but unevenly distributed. Thank you.